Welcome back to our second video lecture on Quick. For those of you who have subscribed, I am both grateful and honored. Thank you. I promise your patience and willingness to join me on this journey will be amply rewarded. This video will be extremely long. I debated about breaking it up into several smaller videos, but in this introductory phase, I thought it better to just have one video where all the introductory and rudimentary principles were collected in one space. So take your time. Break it down into digestible bites and study it at your leisure. In our last video lecture, I introduced some of the rudimentary principles of Quick, and using some of those same rudimentary principles, I proved the Riemann hypothesis. In this video, I will rigorously establish the Quick limit and formally derive the Quick derivative and the Quick interval. But before I proceed any further, I cannot emphasize strongly enough that Quick has absolutely no intention of trying to overturn or replace Newtonian Leibnizian calculus, which we will abbreviate as NLC from here on out. Most of the rules and principles of NLC that you may have already learned or will learn in the future are just as valid and every bit as relevant in Quick as they are in NLC. The power rule and chain rule work just as well in Quick as they do in NLC. Quick takes no issue with the practical applicability of NLC. It is the theoretical underpinnings of NLC that Quick has found to be intellectually unsatisfying and mathematically untenable. It's NLC's faulty foundation that Quick is trying to remedy so that the discipline can function rationally and logically as it was meant to be. Here's a conventional definition of calculus taken from the Oxford Dictionary. Even though Newton and Leibniz are credited with having invented calculus, it took hundreds of years before and after Newton and Leibniz for mathematicians to thrash out the rules and theorems that is the modern version of calculus. Quick does not fully agree with the Oxford definition of calculus. However, here's a definition of calculus I'm sure both NLC and Quick would agree with. Calculus is a process that computes how much or how little something changes. Differentiation is a method wherein an exact value is computed for some rate of change at any given value of x. We proved in the previous lecture that a derivative is a quaternion and that all derivatives as trigonometric functions must obey all the rules of quaternions pertaining thereto. I will now list several rules that govern quaternions. Almost all these rules can be found in Baker's quaternions as a result of algebraic operations. I list these rules and definitions without benefit of proof or explanation. We will revisit any or all of these rules when needed during the course of deriving and providing quick end proofs and concepts if and when required. There exists several definitions of quaternions accompanied by a vast complicated array of theories and mathematical derivations surrounding their use. These theories and derivations can be extremely complicated and frustratingly complex. Oliver Heaviside went so far as to call quaternions a positive evil of no inconsiderable magnitude. Much of this confusion and complication comes from trying to visualize and utilize quaternions according to their gyrodynamic properties. Well, whatever you may have learned about those properties and their uses, just ignore them for now we will be concentrating almost exclusively on the algebra of the quaternion. And that algebra is rooted in two all-encompassing fundamental equations, i equals jk and i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals ijk equals negative one equals e to the pi i equals e to the theta i equals cosine theta plus var epsilon sine theta equals Euler's formula. These two fundamental equations form the whole of trigonometry, which is the whole of quick. We will rely on two working definitions of the quaternion. Baker's definition where a quaternion is a scalar or a vector or a combination of the two. And the quick definition where a quaternion is a trigonometric identity. Quick has revisited some of the work of Hamilton and Tate and have incorporated several of their concepts into Quick. Examples of their works may be found in several of the older books I've listed in the description of the video. 
Quick is essentially the study and application of the algebraic relationships existing between the sine, cosine, and tangent. The whole of trigonometry, and therefore the whole of quick, is compactly packaged within the unit circle, which is governed by Euler's formula. Quick is based upon the equivalency of the trigonometric identities. Quickian differential calculus computes the derivative by pinpointing the tangent point of choice. However, we may just as easily and equivalently compute the secant point of choice. Or for that matter, we may pinpoint any trigonometric identity of choice since all trigonometric identities are equivalent. Euler's identity is conventionally given as e to the pi i equals negative one. But in the Quickian unit circle, since the tangent is equivalent to one, then Quick uses the more convenient expression of e to the i theta equals e to the i pi equals one, as opposed to the more conventional expression e to the theta i equals e to the pi i equals negative one. Therefore, Quick establishes that e to the i theta precessing counterclockwise yields e to the i theta equals minus cosine theta plus i sine theta equals one, which is equivalent to the sagitta theta plus i sine theta, which is equivalent to the versine theta plus i sine theta, which equals e to the i pi, which equals one, which is equivalent to the tangent, which is equivalent to the sine, which is equivalent to the sagitta, which is equivalent to the negative cosine, which is equivalent to the secant. Therefore, given quaternion rule number nine, then the cosine is equal to the conjugate of the negative cosine, and the negative cosine, which may be expressed as one over the cosine, is equal to the secant. The variable var epsilon is the general symbol for any unit quaternion uq. The three most common unit quaternions are the quadrantal versors i, j, and k. It is extremely important to note that the quadrantal versors i, j, and k are fully equivalent to the Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. In quick, the operations of conjugates play a major role. In quick, conjugates generally mean opposites, but by the rules of quaternions, reciprocals, opposites, and conjugates are not necessarily the same, even though all three are designated as being negative. But these conjugates may assume a variety of different forms. For example, let's extend a series of four mutually orthogonal e to the i theta unit radii through the unit circle. In quick, the polarity of e determines in what quadrant e is located, and the polarity of the exponents i or theta determines the direction of spin. Carefully note the relationships of the four radii. You can see just how confusing it can be to determine what direction each e to the i theta radius is pointing and what's the direction of their individual spins. Conventionally, a plus or minus sign pairing will form a conjugate pair. That is, by definition, the negative sign is the conjugate of the positive sign, and so it may be conventionally stated that minus e to the minus i theta equals minus cosine theta minus i sine theta is the conjugate of e to the i theta equals minus cosine theta plus i sine theta, because the signs of these two functions have opposite signs. Note, however, that this pair of unit quaternion radii interact orthogonally. In quick, an orthogonal or right angle interaction of unit quaternions create what is called a set of Tavassian conjugates. Therefore, these four unit quaternions, e to the i theta minus e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta minus e to the minus i theta are all orthogonally interacting Tovasian conjugates. Each unit quaternion possesses a set of three corresponding unit quaternion conjugates. These sets consist of one polar opposite Tovasian conjugate and two orthogonal Tovasian conjugates. One of the orthogonal Tovasian conjugates is an equivalent, while the other is an orthogonal opposite or an extreme. Polar opposites are also called linear conjugates. 
The verse sign is defined as the verse sign equals one minus the cosine. This obscure, seldom discussed trigonometric function is one of the most powerful operators in Quick. Quick uses the convention of naming the verse sign the verse sign when it interacts parallel to the cosine and the name sagitta when it interacts orthogonally to the sine. The sine and sagitta are orthogonal to Vossian conjugates. The cosine and verse sine are linear to Vossian conjugates. In order to derive the Quickian limit and demonstrate how it differs in both theory and applicability from that of the NLC limit, I will first present the NLC version and then immediately follow up with the contrasting Quickian interpretation. The formal Newtonian, Leibnizian, or NL definition of the limit is given as the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists if and only if the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x equals the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x. Now to further examine this definition, let's start from first principles. Following closely from the video, the best explanation of limits and continuity, we ask, what is a NL limit? It's the Y value that a function pretty much approaches. What's continuity? If you can draw the function without lifting your pencil up from the paper while drawing it, then it is continuous. A limit is generally written as the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals C, which is a Y value. This says that the limit of f of x is a y value that pretty much approaches y as x pretty much approaches c. Suppose we are given the equation the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x equals 3. From this equation, we may deduce the following. This means that as x equals 4 approaches from the left, the limit of g of x equals 3. This means that as x equals 4 approaches from the right, the limit of g of x equals 3. If these two equations are true, then the limit exists, which creates the formal definition of a limit. That is, if the left and right side of the equation are equal, then the limit exists. And if the left and right side of this equation are not equal, then the limit does not exist. It's clear that as x approaches 2 from the left, the y value limit is 2. It's clear that as x approaches 2 from the right, the y value limit is 1. If the limits on either side of 2 are not equal, then the limit does not exist. However, if x actually equals 2 as opposed to approaching 2, then the answer is 1. Conversely, we see that both limits are equal on either side of 3, so the function is continuous. But in actual value, at 3 does not exist. Therefore, we may formally state that a function is continuous when the limit as x approaches a equals the function f of a. And so in summary, a limit is a y value. We get this y value by inserting several different x values into the function, the limit as x approaches c of f of c. But we do not insert just any x values, but x values that approach the limit from both the left to right and from the right to left. But what does approach actually mean? Approach means we can keep inserting various x values into the function on each side of C until we see the y value that the two opposed groups of x's are approaching or is targeting or is getting the closest to. Approach means that we may allow the x values to get as close to C as we like but X is never allowed to actually reach C. However, reaching C isn't necessary. We need only recognize the final destination our troops of X's are marching toward in order to determine the final Y value limit. These approaching phalanxes of opposing X's create the limit equation as X approaches C from the left of F of X equals the limit as X approaches C from the right of F of X which guarantees that the limit actually exists. 
The value of a function is not necessarily equal to the limit of a function, but in those cases where the limit of a function is also equal to the value of that function, then the NLC form of the continuity equation is created where the limit as x approaches c is equal to the function f of c. Now that we have a fairly good idea of what the NLC limit is, you are probably asking yourself, okay, but of what use is it? Why is any of this important? It's important because in NLC, you can only differentiate a function that is continuous. And so it is necessary to first verify that the function is continuous before attempting to differentiate it. And the function is verified as being differentiable if the limit as x approaches a is equal to the function f of a. And why do we need to differentiate? To determine the exact location of something that is constantly changing. It has been established that the formal definition of the NLC limit is the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x equals the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x. Quick agrees that this equation is mathematically correct. However, Quick finds this equation to be practically useless. In light of how it is conventionally interpreted, this expression fails based upon two critical constructs. Quantities as x approaches c from the left and as x approaches c from the right. The term approach confirms nothing mathematically and gives us next to nothing in terms of practical or useful information. However, conventional textbooks and instructors will encourage us to approximate and guess our way to an answer all under the guise of this fuzzy, nebulous term called approach. We are encouraged to best guess where the y value limit truly is. Proponents of the NLC limit will immediately counter such a quickie in assertion with, well, it's obvious what point is being approached. You can see that the x values on the left are getting closer and closer to c, and that the x values on the right are getting closer and closer to c, which is undeniably true. But what is also undeniably true is that those x's are getting closer and closer to values that are also close to c. Which close value do we choose? We presumably know what c is and where c is because we are told what its value is in the equation, which is perfectly valid. But we are not told how close up or how far back we may begin creeping up on either side of c, and most importantly, we are not told how large or how small we are allowed to make our steps or increments as we advance upon c. For instance, suppose c equals four. Starting from the left, at zero, we can take infinitesimal increments of x, creeping our way toward some y value. But what y value? Toward what limit? Who is to say what increment delivers the true derived y value of the limit? Again, the instructors will say, well, we pretty much told you what the y value will be when we pretty much told you what c will be. Anyway, you can plainly observe that c is the endpoint. But can we plainly see this, or do we just nod our head in agreement because the instructor said so? When taking these incremental infinitesimal steps, I can't even see one, let alone four. I can always take infinitely smaller steps, which means I don't ever have to get close to four, or three, or two, or even one. I can stay in a Zeno's paradox state indefinitely. Conversely, starting on the right, what if I elect to take incremental steps of three, starting at five? Since I can't overshoot four, the limit is any point between four and five since I can approach any of these remaining points. NLC instructors will counter with, you have to keep your increments to a size that allows you to get close enough so you can see the limit. That's why you should use infinitesimal steps like dx and not big giant steps like delta x. Well, what increment is too big or just right? What increment is close enough? What increment is too far away? And how close do I need to be in order to confirm? Yep, that's the limit right there. I can see it. It's right there in plain sight. 
All of these ambiguous NLC concepts confirm what many calculus students have wrestled with for centuries. There is absolutely nothing mathematically sound about the NLC concept of approach. It is at best a rolling approximation, an educated guess. Now to be fair, there is nothing inherently wrong with using such approximations. It's only when we are later told by our instructors that a limit is an exact quantity verified by the continuity equation that we begin to lose our mathematical bearings. Our once strong mathematical foundation suddenly becomes all weak and wobbly. This uneasy fuzziness surrounding the approach can all be avoided if it is initially stipulated that we must start at the same finite distance from C on either side of C and proceed in the same base increment of steps, both sides advancing toward C. This, however, makes finding the limit moot. This assures we will always find the limit to exist or not exist at the midpoint of twice the finite distance, which we will see has tremendous utility, but is essentially prohibited in conventional teachings. The epsilon delta proof allows X to get as close as it wishes to see, but those advancing X's can never reach C. However, the midpoint actually does reach C. In fact, the midpoint will always be C. But again, such a midpoint process is prohibited in NLC. Once again, the instructor will counter with, we very clearly demonstrated in this graph that approaching from the left yields a limit of two and approaching from the right yields a limit of one. Even if we were to adopt this so-called midpoint strategy of starting equidistance on either side of the midpoint and advancing in the same incremental steps, we would still get the two unequal limits. But again, I ask, would you? NLC says that when you approach from the left, you are approaching too. But Quick says maybe, maybe not. That hole, presumably at two, says there is a void, that there is no Y at that point. We don't know what is there. It could be a completely different coordinate system with a completely different set of coordinates. It may actually be a continuation of the original function. We just don't know. But what we do know is that the closer you get to that hole, the further away you get from the certainty of an existing two. And the closer you get to one, the closer you get to the certainty of an existing one, a real value that actually exists within the manifest coordinate system. Which brings us to our last point. Given the continuity equation, where the limit as x approaches c equals the function f of c, then if we can get as close as we wish to c, but can never reach c, then it is impossible for this NLC version of the continuity equation to exist. It is certainly possible for each half of the equation to exist independently, but they can never exist as an equality. They are mutually exclusive. One eliminates the other since obtainment of C is prohibited in the one case and is contrarily a necessary requirement for the other. Quick will now introduce a series of theorems and definitions that establish the quick limit and to prove that the NLC version of the continuity equation is not valid. Theorem 2 simply establishes that the sine and verse sine are equivalent and orthogonal to Vossian conjugates. From theorem two, we may deduce corollary three, and corollary three establishes the Tavassian conjugational relationships existing between the sine, versine, sagitta, and cosine. From these theorems and corollaries, we can now establish why the approach of C from either side as characterized in NLC is incorrect. The reason is simple. The left X, which is the cosine, can only gain what the versine or right X loses, and the right X can only gain what the left X loses. Trigonometrically, the relationship of cosine to versine is a zero-sum game. That is, whatever one side gains, the other side loses, so that there is a net zero loss. But this is not what is presented in NLC. What the NLC limit implies 
is that the relationship between the cosine and versine is a win-win proposition, that whatever the cosine gains, the opposing versine gains the exact same amount. This is trigonometrically false. Therefore, the NLC continuity equation, as conventionally written and interpreted, is false. From our list of trigonometric identities, the reciprocal of the cosine is the secant. The NLC operation is only trigonometrically viable if the negative cosine is considered as the quaternion reciprocal of the cosine, which is the secant. Let's pay particular attention to the behavior of the black secant. We can now clearly see how the cosine and secant move in opposition to one another along the x-axis. The approach symbol commonly symbolizes the concept of approaches or goes to. Quick fully embraces the notion of as X goes to C. It imports a sense of matriculation or advancement that abruptly stops at C. It implies one of the quintessential qualities of the unit quaternion. The approach symbol holds such great potential as a member of Quickian symbology. However, as I have established, the term approach is so nebulous to the point of being almost useless. The term is so polluted and tainted with NLC fuzziness that Quick has elected to avoid both the term approach and the approach symbol and simply uses the equal sign instead. Also, Quick asserts that C is a double point just as E is a double point unit quaternion. C is composed of both conjugates, C approaching from the left and C approaching from the right. C is a self-conjugate double point where it is impossible to distinguish its individual polar halves. This double point is called the ICR, which is a Quickian limit or Eulerian limit. The Newtonian limit is always designated as being a Y value, whereas in Quick, the limit may be either X or Y or any of the trigonometric identities. Therefore, Quick finds that the approach symbol is ambiguous. C approaching from the right must equal the quaternion minus cosine equals one over the cosine equals the secant. C equals C approaching from the right plus C approaching from the left equals the cosine plus the secant equals zero equals the Eulerian limit. Therefore, given these three reasons, the quick expression of the Eulerian limit is mathematically expressed as follows. The quick expression of the Eulerian limit differs fundamentally from the NLC limit in that it accounts for the quaternionic conjugate interactions of the plus or minus x's and it forces C to obtain an exact value. In quick we stress above all else, adhere to the rules, be logical, use common sense. And as crucial as adhering to the rules might be, your intuition and common sense should not be ignored. Embrace them. When given a statement, stop and ask yourself, does this make sense? For instance, it is conventionally taught that the slope of a vertical line is undefined since X is zero and therefore the slope of Y over zero would be undefined. But if we stop and actually think about this for a second, it becomes clear that this NLC notion of a vertical line having an undefined slope just doesn't make any sense. The very first thing you should say to yourself is, wait a minute, isn't the y-axis a vertical line? As soon as that sinks in, then you should realize that the notion of a vertical line having an undefined slope cannot be true. However, in quick, just as in the NLC, when the sine is zero and the cosine is one, then the slope is zero. However, when the sine is one, the cosine is zero, and therefore the sagitta is one. The sine and sagitta are equivalent, so their slope is one. But the sagitta is also equivalent to the negative cosine. That slope would then be negative one. Therefore, the slope of a vertical line is plus or minus one. As proven in solving the Riemann hypothesis, 
the critical line is equivalent to the I sign and has a slope of zero since it is comprised exclusively of non-trivial zeros. And since every non-trivial zero is a tangent point and therefore a quaternion, and therefore a slope or a rate or a fraction or a ratio, then the critical line has a slope of zero. But it has just been established that I as the I sign has a slope of one but I is also equivalent to the critical line. Therefore, since it has been established that in quick, negative one, zero, and one are all equivalent, then all slopes of negative one, zero, and one are equivalent. The notion of an undefined slope of a vertical line contradicts the very definition of an NLC derivative. Remember, a derivative is a slope, which is a limit, which is a y value, which is a point on a vertical line. All vertical lines are y lines. Therefore, if a vertical line is undefined or has a slope that is undefined, then a derivative or limit cannot be represented by a y value since in NLC, the slope of a vertical line must always be undefined. That is to say, we cannot pinpoint any slope on a line that has been designated as being a zone where slopes are undefinable. This is akin to a fisherman trying to pinpoint a school of fish in the middle of the Sahara Desert. So if we are to accept the existence of a limit as having a y value, then all vertical lines must possess a slope. Even though it's been proven that the slope of a vertical line may take on several equivalent values, by convention, Quick formally defines the slope of the vertical and horizontal lines as follows. The quaternionic expression of Euler's formula is that the slope is equal to the e to the i theta equals minus cosine theta plus i sine theta. The slope of a horizontal line is found when i sine equals zero, which occurs at zero or two pi radians. Therefore, the slope of a horizontal line is negative one. The slope of a vertical line is found when the cosine theta equals zero, which occurs at pi over two radians or three half pi radians. Therefore, the positive slope of a vertical line is one. Vertical and horizontal lines form Tavassian conjugates and thus is reflected in their slopes being of opposite polarity, even though they interact with each other at right angles. This proves that the vertical, horizontal, and orthonormal lines of x, y, and z are fully equivalent to the quadrantal verses i, j, and k, which are by definition quaternions and therefore slopes. There is a major difference in how Quick defines continuity and discontinuity contrasted to the NLC interpretation. In NLC, discontinuity is any break or discontinuation in a function or section of a function that has to be differentiated. This equation ensures continuity and guarantees that the limit actually exists. Where this equation ensures discontinuity and therefore a function that cannot be differentiated. The value of a function is not necessarily equal to the limit of a function, but in those cases where the limit of a function is also equal to the value of that function, then we get the NLC form of the continuity equation, where the limit as x approaches c is equal to the f of c. As has been established, Quick rejects the use and concept of the infinitesimal. Taking infinitesimal steps and breaking functions up into infinitesimal segments serve virtually no purpose in Quick, including the insertion of holes to indicate discontinuity. In Quick, a derivative is a unit quaternion. That unit may be of any size we please. It may be as small as an electron to as vast as a galaxy. Therefore, Quick has little interest in the absolute magnitude of the whole. As a derivative, Quick needs to ask and answer one and only one question. Thus, the whole span more than one unit. If the whole spans one unit, it is by default a quaternion and therefore a derivative. If it spans more than one unit,
then the function is discontinuous at that span of holes because we cannot say what, if anything, exists in that space. Therefore, given the quickie and ICR, then we may define a quick derivative as discontinuity restricted to one unit. So given this graph from quickie and principles, the f of two equals one and the f prime of two equals two. However, in NLC, we get the f of two equals one and the f prime of two does not exist. In quick, any and all functions existing in the Cartesian coordinate system, complex plane, and organ diagram are all differentiable. They must be since they are composed of two or more ICRs or derivatives. In NLC, we are told that curves such as these are not differentiable. In quick, upon inspection, we see immediately where the ICR is formed at the inflection points. These are Quickian textbook examples of the ICR. That is to say, at the ICR, you cannot say what's the direction of either slope. Is it the end of one slope and the beginning of the other, or vice versa? They propagate counter to one another. It is impossible to tell, and since they are conjugates, they cancel at that single point and thus have a value of zero, forming an ICR, or extrema, or a limit, or a derivative at that single point. In most calculus courses, the student is first introduced to the NLC limit. The NLC limit is introduced to prove the continuity of a function. If a function is continuous, it can then be differentiated. In both NLC and QUIC, a derivative is a limit. In both NLC and QUIC, the difference quotient plays a major role in defining a derivative as a limit. I am now going to present a rigorous conventional derivation of the limit, expressed in terms of the difference quotient. It is a classic form of the limit derivation that is being taught almost exclusively in today's schools and universities. Now I will leave it to you to go through the entire NLC proof at your leisure. But the take home message of the proof is that the NLC difference quotient is conventionally given as follows. F prime of A is equal to the limit as H approaches zero of the function F of A plus H minus F of A over H equals a derivative. In short, if we shrink the secant or H to zero, we obtain the tangent, which is the limit which is the derivative. But in NLC, forcing h to equal zero means division by zero, which is prohibited. However, since the derivative is a limit and a limit need not reach zero, making h sufficiently small is all that is required. And this is the fatal flaw of the NLC difference quotient. This is why we get all the fuzziness and ambiguity of approach surrounding the NLC limit. Quick fully embraces this version of the difference quotient with one fundamental exception. Quick replaces the NLC approach sign with the equality sign. Quaternionic or Eulerian differential calculus states unequivocally that not only does H go to zero, but that H must obtain an exact value of zero in order for F prime of X to obtain an exact value of the limit L. In the quick difference quotient, not only does H approach zero, it must actually go to zero. It must actually equal zero in order to form the limit. If H is the versine, then when H equals X equals versine equals zero, it must be the case that X equals cosine equals one. Therefore, there is no division by zero, but rather division by the conjugate of H, which is one. Therefore, the quick difference quotient may be written as follows. Therefore, the quick difference quotient may be written as a slope or a rate or a fraction or a ratio or a conjugate or a limit and is formally defined to be the derivative of the function f at a. Just as with the NLC limit, 
with the quick limit, if the limit exists, f is said to be differentiable at a. Consolidating all our concepts, we derive the Versine form of the difference quotient. And so is now made clear why the Newtonian concept of infinitesimals and approaching zero does not exist in quick. There are no baby steps, no infinitesimal increments. There is no perpetual approach. There is no gradually sneaking up on the function and hovering around and about it in some perpetual state of proximity. There is no dy or dx or dy over dx. There is a delta x, which is essentially h, that is forced to reach zero, whereupon its conjugate is instantaneously formed. The quickian limit is formed at precisely zero. Having presented the conventional method of deriving the difference quotient as derivative, I will now further expand upon the quickian interpretation. Quaternionic Eulerian differential calculus states unequivocally that not only does h go to zero, but that h must obtain an exact value of zero in order for f prime of x to obtain an exact value of the limit l. Consider the following equation. Given the properties of the quickian unit circle, this equation may be rewritten as follows. And given the difference quotient, we may state the following. Therefore, we may state the quantity f of x equals x squared may be immediately eliminated since it is not f prime of x. All i sine equals y equals f of x values may also be eliminated from consideration. Therefore, we obtain the following. which yields the following. Since the versine equals one minus the cosine, then if arbitrarily h equals versine, then necessarily x equals the cosine, allowing that the x-axis is composed of only those two trigonometric functions in the unit circle. Here we use the quickian convention of substituting the approach sign with the equality sign. Again, the quickian interpretation is that the equal sign says as x goes to some value, which means when x is forced to equal some value. There is no nebulous approach, only 100% obtainment. Therefore, we may rewrite equation as follows. In the numerator, the Versine functions equivalently as the sine. Therefore, Versine sub b squared is equivalent to the x squared quantity previously eliminated in the following equation. The quantity Versine sub b squared may also be eliminated by forcing the Versine sub b squared to zero. Therefore, we obtain the following. It is given that the sine 2 theta equals 2 sine theta cosine theta. Therefore, in the numerator of the equation, Then f of x equals h 
takes on the value of the following. This equation asserts that the numerator is indeed the rise portion of the slope, even though the numerator is composed exclusively of run elements. In this equation, the cosine and verse sine sub a are coupled as a conjugate pair. Forcing verse sine sub a to zero instantaneously converts the cosine to its maximum value. Therefore, we obtain the following. In the denominator, the verse sine sub c is considered as a true component of the x-axis. However, the application of forcing verse sine to zero cannot be arbitrary and must be applied to all verse signs. Therefore, h equals verse sine sub c must also be forced to go to an exact value of zero. Again, at the instant h equals verse sine sub c obtains an exact value of zero, h equals verse sine sub c is instantaneously transformed into x equals cosine equals 1. Therefore, we obtain the following. This equation may now be expanded which leads to the conjugate version, which is as follows. And its compact form is written as follows. Therefore, we state the following definition. Once again, I will leave it up to you to study this proof at your leisure. But the take home message of this proof is that this equation asserts that given some function f prime of x squared, when the verse sign is zero, then for any value of x, the slope equals the tangent, which equals two. Another unique quickie method of differentiation is the trigonometric identity method. It is a quick method based upon the fact that all derivatives may be expressed as some trigonometric identity. To illustrate, note that the limit L, the slope M, and the derivative F prime of X are all Y values. You may wonder, how could that be since if the slope is equal to Y over X, which is equal to, then Y equals 2X. How can the y value be simultaneously two separate values? The equivalency of y and the tangent is confirmed in this diagram of the trigonometric identities where the sine is displaced to the right until it coincides with the tangent or equivalently, the tangent is displaced until it coincides with one which is also equivalent to the secant. Therefore, we obtain the following. which again verifies that all vertical lines as Y lines must possess a defined slope. Therefore, in terms of the difference quotient, we may write the following equation. It is a very simple and elegant method of deriving the difference quotient as derivative. As the sign is moved to the right, the cosine increases in value, approaching a maximum value of one, while simultaneously the verse sign loses a proportional value approaching a value of zero. The limit, and therefore the derivative, may be found under the following conditions.
We have asserted that the sagitta and sign were equivalent to Vasian conjugates. Here we present a rigorous proof of that assertion. Once again, I will leave it to you to study this proof at your leisure. The take home message is that the secant is a constant slope of negative one from zero to pi radians with a constantly varying length. The tangent maintains a constant length of one with a constantly varying slope. Both tangent and secant will pinpoint the exact same derivative or quaternion along the circumference of the unit circle. In quick, we may employ any trigonometric identity to serve as the independent variable x equals h. The Tavassian conjugate of that identity, linear or orthogonal, is then determined. This then becomes the limit or substituted y value to be derived via the difference quotient, which is the derivative. We will now introduce another unique Quickian derivative, the Fermatian derivative. Fermat began with a simple problem. Given a line, divide it into two parts such that the product of the parts will be a maximum. And so we allow the total length of a line to be designated as B. And we divide line B into two segments, segment A and segment B minus A. Multiplying segment B minus A by A yields A times B minus A equals AB minus A squared. And from this, Fermat created his now famous pseudo equality, which simplifies to 2A plus E equals B. Having obtained 2A plus E equals B, Fermat said, suppress E, arbitrarily making E equals zero. And when he did that, he obtained the quantity A equals B over two which turns out to be the exact solution of the problem, which also turns out to be the exact limit or maxima for the problem. Fermat never explained why in one instant it was okay to treat E as a non-zero number and divide through the equation with it, and then immediately consider it as being zero by suppressing it. He knew it would work, but he gave no justification for why it would work. But it is undeniable that Fermat's simple ad equality method established a mathematical procedure for computing the maxima of a curve, and this in turn computes the limit. His succinct command, suppress E, essentially asserts, find the limit by allowing E to go to zero. In short, he was one of the first to compute a derivative as a limit. He invented the modern day derivative and the basis for finding the maxima and minima of curves. The maxima and minima are called extrema. Unfortunately, like most mathematicians and students, he lost sight of what it was he was actually manipulating. Fermat was correct in his suppression of E because E doesn't go to zero algebraically. E goes to zero trigonometrically. Mathematicians have completely ignored what E and H actually are. Calculus is trigonometry. E and H are at their most rudimentary line segments expressed in terms of the cosine. When E goes to zero, E is not being taken to an algebraic zero, but rather to its trigonometric minima, that minima being the conjugate of the maxima. Therefore, when E reaches its lowest point, zero, or its minima, it is then obligatorily and simultaneously transformed into its maxima. In the unit circle, this maxima is manifest as one or E or E star and that one or E or E star intersects the circumference at one unique specific point. In Newtonian differentiation, this point is the tangent. However, Quickian principles allow for the derivative to be expressed as a quaternion or as any point along the circumference of the unit circle or as any trigonometric identity, especially the secant. This concisely accounts for the exact precision of the Eulerian limit and the derivative. This is the essence of the Eulerian limit. We may now state Fermat's rule. The quantity plus or minus one half of anything, anytime, anywhere, in whatever form it may obtain is and will always be an extrema and therefore a limit and therefore a derivative and therefore exact and finite. Having now established Fermat's rule, let's revisit Fermat's problem using Quickian principles. Given a line, divide it into two parts 
such that the product of the parts will be a maximum. Given Quickian principles and the definition of the versine, then the sagitta plus the cosine equals 1 equals cosine plus versine. Therefore, we see that the problem is easily solved. The cosine and versine are conjugates. Whatever one function gains, it must gain from the other. Trigonometrically, we may express this dependence upon the versine as an axiom. When the cosine goes to zero, the versine must then go to one. Therefore, every gain produces an equal loss. That gain and loss is balanced only when both cosine and versine are equal. That is, they reach this balance when the confluence of maxima and minima form a double point that equals a net zero, an ICR. Thus, when both are equal at A equals B minus A, they form an ICR at precisely one half B. Therefore, E is equivalent to X plus H. By suppressing E, that is, as E goes to zero, the limit of F of A is obtained and thus the derivative f prime of a equals one half b is derived exactly. Such a derivative is called a Fermatian derivative. The Fermatian derivative is simply the midpoint strategy suggested earlier while deriving the continuity equation. Of course, the Eulerian fundamental theorem of calculus demands the existence of a Fermatian integral. A Fermatian integral would therefore be found by simply adding the two parts and thus restoring one. Therefore, Quick finds the Fermatian integral equals 2a equals b. As far as I can tell, the Quick central method of differentiation is unique to Quick. It uses the physics of the central to compute an ICR, which in turn is equivalent to either an integral or derivative. We will forgo a detailed kinematic examination of the centroid. For our purposes, we will consider the centroid to be a set of two counter-rotating circles whose edges are always in contact at one and only one point. This is called being tangent at their common point. This point of contact is called the instantaneous center of revolution, or the ICR. Since the two circles are always rotating counter to each other, then their mutual point of tangency, or the ICR, always possesses a velocity of net zero. This forms a set of conjugates, or a double point. At the ICR, it is impossible to determine the direction or spin of either circle since the net spin of both at the ICR is exactly zero. Conventionally, one of the circles may be considered as being static while the other circle precesses about it. The static circle is called the space centroid. The moving circle is called the body centroid. A collection or concatenation of two or more ICRs is called a centroid. The space central may be considered as an infinite collection of zero velocities or stops or ICRs or derivatives. Why derivatives? Because a derivative is an instantaneous momentary stop or an instance of zero velocity that pinpoints the exact location of an ever-changing object. The ICR is always mutually tangent to both curves and each curve precesses counter to the other, thus forming conjugates. Since the ICR is tangent to both curves, the ICR defines the slope of the curve's mutual tangent line. Therefore, the ICR is the derivative of both the space and body centroids. And since the ICR is a slope, then it is, by definition, a quaternion. Here we see the precessing point E along the circumference forming an ICR consisting of the Tavassian conjugate pairs the secant and the tangent for i and the tangent. However, at the ICR, the derivative and integral are indistinguishable and interchangeable. And so in summary, any and every ICR is a slope or a derivative. ICRs are quaternions. ICRs concatenate to form centroids. Quaternions concatenate to form centroids. Any and every ICR is always a dual point. Unit quaternions, i, j, and k 
may be considered as being centrodes since I equals JK. Quaternions are centrodes. Every position on the centrode is unique. Every position on the centrode is a quaternion. The unit circle is a centrode. The centrode is a curve of constant precession. The centrode is in a state of constant precession as are its constituents. The centrode is the locus of at least two ICRs. The ICRs are rolled or rotated or precessed into existence and just as quickly rolled or rotated or precessed out of existence. At the ICR, the derivative is equal to a point which is equal to I was equivalent to E becomes indistinguishable from the integral, which is equal to an area, which is equal to JK, which is equivalent to E star. Therefore, F prime of X is equal to Y equals ICR is equivalent to I equals JK equals gamma equals alpha beta, which is equivalent to beta over alpha, which is equal to E to the I theta, which is equal to minus cosine theta plus var epsilon sine theta. Before studying this section, I strongly suggest you go to the Methoma website and review the video, 3D Rotations in General, Rodriguez Rotation Formula, and Quaternion Exponentials. You will be hard pressed to find a more rigorous, exhaustive explanation of the Quaternion Rotator and 3D Rotations. Links are in the description. Quaternion Equation Q prime equals Q parallel plus E to the I theta times Q perpendicular. This quaternion equation precesses any arbitrary quaternion Q about any arbitrary axis provided that arbitrary axis is parallel to the unit quaternion UQ. This equation is a very useful mathematical distillation of quaternion precession. However, it lacks an intuitive sense of just how the unit quaternion E to the I theta is operating. Consider rule two, the quaternion multiplication table an accompanying mnemonic IJK circle instructs us on how to multiply quaternions. The first quaternion or operator is always the UQ or unit quaternion and operates at a right angle on the second quaternion, the operand. Their operation is to precess or transform quaternion Q into the new quaternion. Therefore, the UQ operator E to the I theta operates on operand Q precessing Q into the new quaternion Q prime. Therefore, E to the I theta Q equals Q prime. Once again, referring to the multiplication table, proceeding clockwise, then I turns J into K, or I times J equals K, or I J equals K, or J K equals I, or K I equals J Proceeding counterclockwise, we generate their conjugates. I turns K into negative J, or I K equals negative J, or K J equals negative I, and J I equals negative K. Once again, referring to our I J K circle, to precess J pi radians to a final position of negative J requires I equals U Q to rotate J into K clockwise. As a unit quaternion, I rotates its operand J in pi over two increments. Therefore, to complete reversion and convert J to negative J, I must operate on J twice. The first rotation yields IJ equals K. To complete the total pi radians rotation, the next rotation must rotate K to negative J by I, which the IJK circle indicates is indeed true giving I K equals negative J. However, inherent in this operation in the quaternion algebra is the fact that I reverse this operational direction of rotation because I K equals negative J is obtained only by I operating in the reverse, that is in a counterclockwise direction. This is an example of planar precession, the concurrent execution of both rotation and precession by a UQ or unit quaternion. We will now establish the quaternion rotator. Consider the following theorem.
having considered the theorem and the proof, we find that therefore Q prime is the result of Q having been rotated twice, 0.5 theta by P and 0.5 theta by the conjugate of P, P star. Therefore, any two of the four unit quaternions, e to the i theta minus e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta, and minus e to the minus i theta, may act as a conjugate pair in forming a quaternion rotator. We may expand this equation. in terms of the centro yielding the following. In a later video, we will explore how the current version of the first postulate of quantum mechanics has been erroneously interpreted as a probability and absurdly misapplied. It is this expression of the quaternion rotator that is the true expression of the first postulate of quantum mechanics. Proof of the quaternion rotator supplies us with the basis for solving the Beal conjecture. Here we present a proof of the Beal conjecture. Once again, I will leave it up to you to study this proof at your leisure. But upon studying the proof, you will see that here we have yet again another exquisitely simple margin proof. If we allow the integers a, b, and c to represent the prime integer exponents 2, 3, 5, respectively, and x, y, z to represent their integer powers 14, 4, 8, respectively, then by the law of exponents, 14 times 2 plus 4 times 3 equals 5 times 8 equals 28 plus 12, which equals 40. And since a, b, and c are prime, then they can have no common prime factor. Therefore, the Beal conjecture is false. We will further explore the power and versatility of the quaternion equation, q to the n equals nq, in our next video lecture.